Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust. Broadcasting Live presents Two Guys and a Bible with Don Preston and William Bell. Join us each week at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central as we bring you exciting, sound, challenging, and comforting messages regarding the end times. Thank you for tuning in today. Don Preston is the founder of Preterist Research Institute, or PRI. Don is a prolific author, having written and published 19 books, a host of audio and DVD studies, and is a debater and defender of the full preterist view. His websites are BibleProphecy.com, Eschatology.org, and DonKPreston.com. William Bell is the founder of AllThingsFulfilled.com Ministries and has a website bearing the same name, and has authored three books, audios and DVDs. He has published hundreds of articles and recordings. And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Two Guys in a Bible broadcast with Don Preston and William Bell. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I don't, I don't hear William. Uh, heard the end. Are you there? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what the deal is. Uh, maybe more of, <laughs> of these kind of ongoing uh, uh, technical problems that spring up with us from time to time. Um uh, I do not know if I am being heard. Uh, I logged on. Everything seemed to be working just fine. But uh, at the moment, uh, I cannot hear William at all. So I do not know if I am on. And uh, I don't have my phone with me at the moment either. So um, I, I will step away for a moment and get my phone uh, and Rod MacArthur, uh, Rod MacArthur, <laughs> Rod Rupert, if you're watching uh, or if you're listening, send me a text, please. Thank you. back. I have my phone. So, um, folks, if you can hear me, if I am online, someone please that has my phone number, send me a text and let me know. Uh, I, I have no, in, no indication that I am not online, but again, I cannot hear William Bell at all uh, in case he is there somewhere. Uh, so, I don't know what in the world has happened. The intro played just like it's supposed to, uh, like when uh, like when uh, William is online and uh, on air. And so, again, I don't really know what in the world is going on, but I'm going to proceed as if I'm on air and hope that my uh, hope that my words don't simply go into the air. Uh and William tells me that he is on, that he can hear me. It's just that we don't have any uh, uh, don't have we don't have any connection between the two of us. William, since you are on, I'm going to reboot and come back on. All right, I'm logging off now. that it does there we are uh i just needed to change my microphone setting and he didn't give me a chance to do it before he checked out of here i tried to send him a text but he signed off immediately after he said it i've been here all the time i want to welcome you once again to two guys in a bible right here on fulfill radio a voice you can trust and while we are waiting for dr don preston to 
re-enter the um, studio. Uh, we just want to say good evening to you. Hope that you had a very relaxed and peaceful um, Labor Day and time off. I know for those of you who are uh, maybe still, you know, working, and we know a lot of you are, you know, probably – uh, in the same age bracket that I am or, you know, close to it or older. And uh, work is a thing of the past for you as far as, you know, going to a job. And um, but nevertheless, you know, still there are many honeydews and everything else that you have to do around the house and other places. And so um, uh, let me Don is sending me a message. Uh, let me tell him. So he's trying to reboot his computer and everything. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll try to let him know in the process that everything is okay and that next time he just needs to kind of hold his horses a little bit and not move so fast uh, because, you know, I do a lot of recordings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I did one today on Facebook that was about two hours, and I got to upload it to uh, several um, social media platforms, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera. And so my computer gets a lot of workout uh, throughout the day. And sometimes what that does is because I'm using different um, formats, platforms to record. You know, for example, I might use Zoom on one recording, another recording. I might go straight into the camera. Um, then another recording I'm using, you know, live on Facebook or whatever and uh, or doing, you know, something else. And sometimes, you know, and I have several microphones checked, uh, excuse me, connected to my computer. And because of that, you know, sometimes it just selectively chooses a camera or a microphone, and I'm not aware of which one it chooses. Uh, you know, the one that I chose for Zoom earlier, you know, was fine, but now when I get ready to do blog talk, uh, it tends to choose another one, and so I have to, you know, fix, sit here and figure that out, which I did, but I heard done from the very beginning, and you all couldn't hear me, but I was already on before uh, before he came on uh, to speak, and um, so that's just the way it is with this technology and us, you know, trying to get, get it together. Uh, but everything is fine. There was no problem with his computer. I hope he doesn't create one with um, trying to sign out and sign back in. I tried to get a message to him as quickly as I could to tell him everything was okay. And, um, you know, unfortunately did not. And, uh, but nevertheless, he should be back in soon. I know what it can be like, especially when you've signed into one of these social media platforms and then you sign out to try to come back in. Sometimes it's not as easy or uh, smooth as you would like for it to be. It takes a ton of time, and you may run into some you know, connectivity issues in the process. So, uh, and, and then all the while that I'm trying to communicate with him, people keep trying to tag me on Facebook, and, and um, you know, that's the problem with these phones and all this multiple communication, uh, multimedia communication deal. You can't even get a message through without somebody, you know, uh, trying to reach you. And so that's the way it is. Um, but, you know, we love it because technology is what allows us to get the message out and has allowed us to reach across platforms and around the world at uh, little to no cost for the most part. And that is absolutely incredible. Couldn't have done this with newspaper or any other type of uh, media in the in the past. Well, I see Dr. Preston has made it back in. We want to commend him for, for that and then kind of slap his hand for moving so quickly before he could let me get the problem worked out. <laughs> but, <laughs> but nevertheless, we're here. Don, I was on all the time. Um, apparently, Blog Talk Radio just decided to choose a different mic than my um, oh. studio mic using for the mixer and I had to just figure that out and uh, I did by the time you were uh, saying okay I'm going to sign out and reboot my computer and I text you a message you didn't get that but I've been here the whole time so everything's okay. fine uh, and your audio is working fine everything's good well that's good I, I tell you I, I thought it was just one of those kind of arbitrary and capricious things and evidently it was if they changed microphones on you without any kind of notification but uh, I was checking my mic levels, and everything was seemed to be working uh, properly here. And I'm thinking, well, okay, I don't know what in the world is going on. 
it's uh, again, I thought it was just one of those things that pops up with Skype every once in a while. So uh, I'm glad that we're both on. Glad everything's uh, working at the moment. It's great to be back, of course. Hope everything is well in your in your world. It's certainly hectic in mine, is, and I know it is in yours. And uh, been uh, you know been a good week. Of course, this is going to be a short week in some ways. Uh, I took yesterday as the uh, uh, Labor Day holiday. Uh, managed to get out and work on one of my old vehicles. That was very relaxing. Uh, kind of a good getaway. Enjoyed that a whole lot. Well, that's very good. I, uh, you know, it was kind of a relaxing day for me on yesterday as well. I think I took quite a bit of that time, you know, going back and forth in these discussions we've been having on Facebook. You know, I, I uh, got a chance to post some things on there, and it's almost hilarious, you know, just kind of watching the uh, dodgeball that's played in, in that arena. And um, But I know you've done some of that too as well. And yet I think, you know, progress is being made as, as we go through. Um, uh, we're not seeing, you know, a lot of the uh, information that we're posting being really addressed. And I think some wise people are paying attention and uh, seeing that, and I think it'll bear fruit in time. So I'm, you know, I'm grateful for that. Um, the rest, you know, we just kind of kicked back the, the um, uh, family came over a little bit and spent a little time and, you know, that was it. So it's been pretty much a relaxing day mixed with, you know, some work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, you mentioned those, uh, those, uh, exchanges on Facebook. And like you said, uh, what we're seeing there is a whole lot of dodgeball. Uh, you know, these, these ministers come on there and they, they accuse us of being everything in the world except Christians. Uh, I mean, we, we, we evidently qualify to be the Antichrist uh, in their <laughs> estimation. But the trouble of it is, when, when you just openly expose the fallacy of their claims, all of a sudden they will not answer the questions. Uh, you have challenged Kyle Mazingale, for instance, I don't even know how many times to answer some really simple questions on Daniel chapter 12. I have likewise challenged him to answer some questions on Daniel chapter 12, and he absolutely refuses. And so when, when you have a text that is explicitly addressing the issue of the resurrection of the dead, and when that text contains Elements in it that, number one, Jesus emphatically and specifically applied to the first century. And by the way, even these ministers who are attacking William and me are from the Churches of Christ. And their tr the traditional view in the Churches of Christ is that these passages in Daniel are applied by Jesus to the time and events leading up to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Well, of course, historically, these brethren and in the churches of Christ, there has been an absolute ignorance, and I mean an absolute ignorance of the reality that not only these, the, does Jesus apply some of Daniel chapter 12 to the fall of Jerusalem in 8070, I should say, to the events leading up to uh, that, that judgment and his coming. But Daniel chapter 12 is so clear, so explicit, so emphatic, that all of, the, all of the things that he predicted, including the Great Tribulation, yes, in the Churches of Christ, that has to do with the first century leading up to the fall of Jerusalem in 8070. But Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 immediately follows verse 1. Verse 1 is the Great Tribulation. And Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, is the resurrection. And Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, emphatically, explicitly, posits the fulfillment of, quote, all of these things, which includes the Great Tribulation, the resurrection, the time of the end, the righteous shining forth in the kingdom, all of those things, not some, not even most, all of those things 
are positive to be fulfilled at the time when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered. And so when William and I have asked, when we have challenged these ministers to, to tell us, when did the Great Tribulation take place? Total silence. When does Jesus, when and where does Jesus posit the fulfillment of all of those things which of necessity, contextually, grammatically, linguistically, includes the resurrection. Where does Daniel posit the fulfillment of all of those things? Absolute total silence. Instead, they go off on another tirade, accusing us of other and more heresies, but not once will they even attempt to answer the questions. Now, you've challenged Kyle Mazingale probably three times to answer the question. I've challenged More him four <laughs> times. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I've challenged him no less than four times, today included, and still not so much as a keystroke of response. Now, folks, if that doesn't tell you something about the about the fact that Kyle Mazingale his running mate there, at least on Facebook, uh, Scott Russell, and the others that are on there chiming in with him when they, every one of them, refuse, adamantly refuse to answer questions that are based on the statements of the text, then you know very good well that they cannot look themselves in the mirror and believe that they're dealing honestly with the text. They, there's just simply no way that they can believe that they are. So uh, it, it's been rather enlightening. It's been and is rather amazing to engage with these guys. Uh, and again, the strange thing about it is, the ironic and sad thing about it is, William Bell and I are, are the ones affirming exactly and precisely what the text says, yet we are being called the heretics. Now, isn't that ironic? And yet, that's exactly what's happening. So, anyway, yeah, it's a, it, it's, it's a fascinating exchange. And, and of course, the, another interesting thing about it is, folks, uh, William and I have, have and do impress upon everyone the need to understand Hebraic thought. Well, just recently, Kyle Mazingale challenged me to provide some scholars who support the concept of Hebraic thought in regard to resurrection. I gave some of those quotes. I acknowledged in the quotes, I acknowledged that even though one of them believes in a future resurrection, that he gave no supporting context, supporting biblical text, to support his claims. He, but he did say that the original concept, the original Hebraic view of resurrection was of a corporate reality. Not individual bodies coming out of the grave, but a corporate resurrection and national restoration. He goes ahead to say that that concept was changed to speak of individual bodies coming out of the grave, but he never gave any proof for it. He never gave a single verse. He never gave any proof whatsoever. Well, when I pointed that out, Mr. Mazingale comes back and simply tries to, to argue, well, Mr. Levinson is a futurist. Well, big deal. I pointed that out myself. And William went ahead and pointed out several massive, massive discrepancies in, in their use of, of Levinson uh, and John Collins and some of these other scholars. And they completely ignore they completely ignore every single thing that William and I point out in regard to what these scholars are saying. And then they just continue repeating their little mantra about, uh, yeah, and again, the, the, the reality, reality of it is they have literally scoffed and ridiculed William Bell and me for appealing to the necessity of understanding Hebraic thought. Now, all of a sudden, guess what? 
They're saying we have to understand Hebraic thought. And William and yeah, I are going, try- <laughs> yeah. They're, they're trying to turn the tables, Don. They're trying to now say they are advocating Hebraic thought and we're advocating Grecian thought. I thought it was exactly. so interesting. <laughs> yes. I mean, it, it, uh, when I read the very first round of that, uh, in which Carl Mazingale said that we are appealing to Grecian thought, I literally sat back in my chair going, wait a minute, what just happened here? <laughs> I, I just laughed and I laughed and I laughed because of the utter fallacy of what he was saying. He was saying that we are appealing to Grecian thought when from the very get-go, we are the ones appealing to Hebraic thought. He is the one appealing to Hebraic thought. Excuse me, Grecian thought. Yes. And and so I I tell you, uh, as William said on the phone the other day, he's just having so much fun doing this. Well, I am too. I mean, (laughs) uh, in a lot of ways, these guys are not even presenting what you would call a, a solid argument on any level. I mean, they, they are just all over the map, literally. And, and, and again, when you point out their other inconsistencies, their contradiction of the scripture, like Kyle Mazingale said in a post yesterday, that Christ, through his death, abolished the death consequence of Adam's sin. <laughs> and I'm talking, <laughs> thank you very much. You just became a full preterist. Now, I didn't write oh. that, but that's what, that's what I was thinking. And then he said, we do not die as a result of our sin. And I'm going, well, uh, once again, thank you very much uh, for, you know, presenting a full preterist view. And then he went ahead once again. Folks, this shows you the confusion. This shows you the rampant confusion and self-contradiction of these men. He turned right around and says that today we die as a direct result of Adam's or consequence of Adam's sin. And I'm going, wait a minute. You just said Christ abolished the consequence of Adam's sin. So do we die as a result of Adam or do we not? So I posted this morning. I said, you've got a major problem here, Tom, as in Gale. According to Paul, we do not die as a result of Adam's sin. We die because of our own sin. Man does not die because Adam sinned. All men die because all men sin. Period. End of story. Adam introduced it into the world. But all men follow Adam into death by sinning themselves. Not because they inherit the sin or the death of Adam. And I pointed out that, you know, Kyle Mazingale has gone completely full-blown Calvinist. And here he is, a member of the Church of Christ, supposedly resisting Calvinism with every ounce of his being. So if men die as a direct consequence of Adam's sin and Adam's death, then that must mean, without any shadow of a doubt, guess what, folks? That means that when a baby dies, they are dying the direct result of Adam's sin and Adam's Death. They inherit Adam's death, not through any sin of their own, just simply by being born into this world. Well, if that's true, then how in the world can he say Christ has removed the death consequence of Adam's sin? I mean, it's just, it's, it's literally astounding how these guys refuse to see the consequence and the implication of their own doctrines. I mean, it really is just, it's astounding. Uh, And and it's sad in a way because they're setting themselves up to be the so-called champions of the truth, defending the truth, defending tradition, defending orthodoxy. And yet 
they argue against themselves every time they set their their fingers to the keyboard. They contradict themselves. So that that's what William Bell and I have been dealing with uh, on Facebook over the last several days. Yeah, you uh, mentioned something that they continue to contradict themselves. You know, I said a long, long time ago that uh, because of their lack of the perspective that preterism gives you when you understand it and you get that framework together, uh, you can see very quickly when arguments, you know, go across the line, you know, when they go outside of the box or out of bounds, et cetera. You can see them, you know, almost instantaneously. And I know you recognize them very quickly. And, uh, and, and I can see them. And it's like, um, you know, I remember uh, one of the guys who survived um, that uh, plane crash in the Andes Mountain when they had to, you know, live in the snow for a while. And, oh, yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, he, he, he was one of the survivors, and he told the story. And he said when they were, um, I think it was two of them, um, when they uh, started climbing their way out of that, you know, after they decided they couldn't stay there and they had to, you know, try to get some help. And they started to climb a mountain. Um, and, and man, I tell you, to hear him describe it, it was just absolutely incredible. Everybody was sitting on the edge of their seats. You just couldn't believe what he was saying. And they're climbing this mountain in this ice with their fingers and their toes and stuff like that, you know, or, or at least, you know, I guess they had boots on or whatever, but still with their fingers and, and uh, just one, you know, breathtaking, uh, just treacherous grasp or step at a time, you know, that, that they're going. And they got to the top of the mountain as they were doing it. And then as soon as they got to the top of the mountain, there was another mountain behind it that they couldn't even oh. see from that one. And yeah. uh, they, had to, they had to climb that one as well. And, uh, I mean, you know, the, the fortitude that they had to have in order to to, you know, survive that situation. And then they said when they got down to the other side, it was just like, you know, summer, bright and sunny and beautiful and everything. And they find, that's how they got rescued. But, the, the, you know, the point that I'm making with that is these guys can't see. They can't, you know, there are so many uh, minds in the field. There's so many blinders out there because of their futurism that they jump on these passages and they think they have an answer. And then the very passage that they're using just destroys them totally. And that's exactly what's happening in these conversations, you know, that have occurred. And, um, and I, I, I just sit back and I'm totally in amazement and just wonder at, you know, the statements that they make and all of the missteps that they make in trying to refute it. And then, you know, they have a cheer squad out there that every time they get caught, their cheerleaders have to come in and say, well, you see, uh, they are right anyway. They haven't answered any yeah. questions. <laughs> <laughs> they're contradicting themselves left and right. They're butchering the historical sources, but they're still right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that's exactly precisely what goes on, and it, it's incredible uh, to witness that, like you said, uh, when, when they can't even realize that the verses that they're appealing to are destroying the, are destroying the very argument that they made. Uh, my father... When I was a very young man, my father would train me and try to train me uh, about uh, or in analytical thought and, and argumentation and what have you. And my father would, used to tell me, he said, anytime somebody makes an argument and gives you a text, what you need to do is go to that text and its context. And if their argument is false, you will almost always find in the very text that they appeal to the refutation of the argument that they are making. And that, I have found that to be true so very often uh, throughout time. And that's precisely what you and I are seeing right now in discussing with these people. When, when they will make an appeal to, uh, well, like Romans 5 and Kyle Nisingale's appeal to it. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, he didn't actually quote Romans 5.12. He just alluded to Romans 5. <laughs> but once again, just like my father used to tell me, 
when you go to the text that they appeal to, however ambiguously they may appeal to it, you find right there how wrong they are, how horribly they are misusing the text. Uh, and, and again, the irony here is, folks, you have to understand that Cal Mazingale and Scott Russell are absolutely not Calvinists. And yet they were making right there on Facebook today, making Calvinistic arguments that they would on any other occasion absolutely categorically reject as heresy. And yet here they are making those arguments against us today. Now, I haven't been back on today to see if Kyle responded to anything that I posted, so I don't know if he did or not. Uh, I'll probably check it in the morning. But all of that said, it doesn't negate the fact that he was making Calvinistic arguments. He'll probably come back if you follow suit of what he's done in the past, saying, I am not teaching Calvinism. Well, anytime you teach that I die as a direct result of Adam, uh, yes, you are. <laughs> you are absolutely <laughs> affirming the Cal Calvinism. And uh, uh, as usual, I am assuming that he will completely ignore the argument about why babies die based upon the argument that he made. The argument that he made was all men die because we inherit the consequence, the death consequence, of Adam's sin. We don't, you know, we don't die because we inherit Adam's sin. Okay? That's Kyle Mazingale's position. We do not die because we inherit Adam's sin. We just get the death that he introduced in the world. We inherit death even though we may not have sinned. Infants inherit the death introduced by Adam, even those infants never sin. So, boy, you talk about almost an unfair situation, it seems to me. And, and, and we inherit it in view of the fact that we have been forgiven of sin. <laughs> exactly where I was going. <laughs> in spite of the fact that we are supposedly forgiven of sin, and thus not under the penalty and consequence of sin, yet according to Kyle Massingale, we inherit the death of Adam, okay, even though we did not sin, inherit his, his sin, and we die because we inherit the death, and we die even though we're forgiven of sin, the wages of sin is death, but even though we're forgiven and therefore should not have any consequences or penalty of sin in our life, yet we do receive the wages of sin in spite of the fact that Christ died to take away our sin, and thus, ostensibly, the consequence of our sin. I mean, th this is such a mishmash of error, of confusion, uh, as I am fond of saying. When I read his uh, post, I say, that's both confused and confusing. It is absolutely horrible. But again, they refuse to see it. So, uh, again, folks, that's what William and I deal with on almost a daily basis, trying to trying to answer uh, our critics in such a way. And, and look, chances of changing Kyle Mazingale and Scott Russell are extremely slim, extremely slim. Their minds are made up. Uh, they're not going. They're not going to admit that they were wrong, no matter what. Okay. But there are other people who are monitoring and auditing these discussions who will see and can see very easily the fallacy of their arguments and will come to understand the truth. So that's a whole lot of why William and I continue to engage people like this uh, in spite of the fact that it's, it's never pleasant to be called a heretic uh, and, and to be ridiculed so profusely, so profoundly, uh, and yet, you know, that's just that's just part of the process. So we do it, and people learn, and people change. That is absolutely correct, and um, 
And it happens pretty much on every platform, whether we're dealing with those guys in the Church of Christ or Hebrew Israelites or uh, others uh, in other, you know, denominational groups. Uh, it, it's the same story over and over again. Uh, what this does, as you said, is it, is it gives us the opportunity to get the word out and to have people to view it from different perspectives. Uh, that has certainly been the case, you know, with the um, now, you know, term, terminated uh, discussion I was having with um, uh, Michael Holloway. But, you know, it brought out so many, you know, other points that were good, and I'm g- glad that it happened. Uh, because I've almost done a complete study of First Corinthians 15 that I'm going to um, either uh, publish one way or the other on video and possibly in a in a book um, that I'm really really um, you know pleased with the, you know I've been just waiting to put these information you know put this information down on paper and just haven't had I guess the motivation to do it um, you know consistently all the way through and yet when you get into a discussion and a country you know a controversial discussion like this. I don't know, for some reason, it just heightens your, um, you know, your inspiration, your motivation, and your, your thinking ability that you can see these things clearly because you have to in order to respond to the arguments, et cetera. And, and when that happens, you know, some great things happen. You, you know, you come up with um, uh, material and, and insights that you didn't have before, and um, that's what makes it good. And so to be able to share that information, I think, is going to be good for, you know, the Predators community, um, at least hopefully so. Oh, I, I'm convinced that it will. I know the chart, one of the charts that you have shared with me is absolutely profound. I, as I mentioned to you on the phone, I think it's one of the best charts I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it is absolutely fantastic. And so I can't wait to see you develop this. Uh, you know, I, I want to see it in a book. I want to see this PowerPoint book uh, that I suggested to you earlier today. I just think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, considering all the material that you put on. And, you know, you you made a comment there, William, that I think is absolutely important, and it's something that I found to be true uh, in in my personal experience. And you said that there's something about the engagement and controversy that sharpens the senses. It it causes us uh, to to focus and and to think. I have said many, many times down through the years, there's absolutely nothing like preparing for a formal public debate or a formal debate of any kind that forces a person to do the kind of study that helps us to understand better. When, when, when you know and when you realize that truth is on the line and that you want the truth, that it's not about winning an argument, it's about the truth. And so... What you do is you look at every single possible argument that you have read or heard from your, you know, opponent, and you analyze that from every possible angle that you can conceive of. That's good for you, you know. Uh, I mean, that, that forces us to think. Okay, if I make the following argument, how will they respond? If they respond, how will I respond? I mean, I find myself doing that constantly, Uh, trying to be as analytical, trying to be as thorough, trying to be as objective, objective and honest as I possibly can be with the evidence that is there. And I have found myself many, many times going down a given road thinking, hey, I think I've got an argument here, only to run up against the testimony of the scriptures that said, no, that's not a good argument. I've had to completely discard it and start all over again. And I know know you've done exactly the same thing. You think you have a good, solid argument? When you look at the actual biblical testimony and evidence, you go, "Well, well, that's not a very good argument after all. I sure don't want to use that because it's not true. And and so preparing for a debate is is some of the most, number one, it's difficult. Number two, it's challenging. And number three, it is extremely rewarding because it forces a person, again, to be as analytical as possible 
to be as thorough as possible, not just simply to assert, to assume this argument is this, this argument is that, this argument will work. No, no, no. If you're going to be an honest student of God's word, if you're going into the debate with the objective, number one, of understanding God's word better, and number two, of presenting that in a cogent, lucid, logical, and convincing way, then it's going to be what I just said. It's going to be convinced, uh, a challenging. It's going to be hard work. It's going to be every single thing that maybe you never thought that it would be. <laughs> I mean, it's really going to put you to the test. Yeah, let me add one other thing about, you know, that preparation as well. That's why it's so important to do as much research and investigation as you can on your opponent and their position. You know, you try to know it at least as well or better than they do. And uh, prior to the discussion, you know, with Michael Holloway, he, he you know, I don't know why he didn't – but I spent a lot of that time asking him questions to draw out what he really believed. And that helped tremendously because if I hadn't done that, I would have been making arguments that were just kind of throwing darts against the wall, hoping that some of them would stick. But as a result of, you know, those dialogues and all those questions that, you know, it took me a while to get some answers, but once I got them, uh, it made – everything so much easier and i could i could fine tune and not only that but you get you know prior commitments to certain passages that they can't say like in the middle of a discussion well that's not what i really meant or whatever because now you got them documented with that it's important to do that as well uh and it, and it helps very much and then sometimes if you do it you know you may decide okay well we don't even need to, to debate that here are some points of agreement that we have and uh, I had a young man on today uh, from California, and we spent about two hours in a, in a discussion. Well, prior to the discussion, I asked him, you know, I said, well, what's your, your background? He says, well, I'm about 80 percent preterist. I said, well, that's good. I said, well, what is it with that additional 20 percent that perhaps we could discuss and see where we can bridge the gap? And he said, well, I'd be interested. And he threw out a few things, you know, that he had, and most of them were easily, you know, answerable as far as the uh, doctrine was concerned, uh, even though they took a little bit of a twist once we got on the line. But still, he did cover some things that were common misunderstandings about the Preterist view, et cetera, and, uh, and we had an opportunity to discuss them. But my aim in going into that, and I told him that, and some of the people that saw the dialogue, I said, look, I don't disagree with the person just for the sake of disagreeing with them. I said, they may have something that they can teach me. And, uh, and so I'm always open, even in the dialogue that I'm having with them. What, what can I learn from you? What is it that you're saying that, you know, maybe I didn't see or what, what's the angle you're coming from that I haven't looked at because that angle may give me an insight to some truth that I have overlooked or didn't quite understand, et cetera. And, and of course, uh, that happened. And I remember having another discussion with, uh, with a guy from that community uh, who was very, uh, very uh, respectful and kind gentleman. And this guy was as well today. And that was, um, he pointed out something from the wisdom of Solomon that said, righteousness is immortality. And it's the moment he said it, you know, it just, my antenna went up like you couldn't believe, and I stopped him right there. You know, I said, wait a minute. I said, repeat that statement. And when he repeated it, I wrote it down. I took a note of it, and I tell you, I, I've used it because it says what the New Testament says. Um, righteousness. Yes, yes, exactly. And, um, and I thought, hey, this is good stuff. And I let him know that, you know, and he appreciated it as well because, um, you know, we were having a dialogue. We weren't arguing against each other. We were discussing with each other even though we had points and counterpoints along the way and and we still have just like today both of us agreed that we would have another discussion and everybody i mean i got tons of compliments from people who heard that first discussion this this one today got cut off from facebook even though i recorded the whole thing so i still have it and i'm going to upload it uh later i'll upload the audio to one of the social media networks and then i'll do the video as well but i mean it's there 
And um, and so it'll help other people who are looking and trying to figure it out because they are now asking questions that they used not to ask, and um, um, which is good. They're seeing some things. And, and, oh, let me say this in the process. He was thinking, just like we have been charged before when we've talked to dispensationalists, particularly when they said we have a very one-sided view of Israel. We're always talking. I think this even came up in your debate with uh, Dr. Brown, uh, M- Dr. Michael Brown. There, uh-huh. We're always saying that, you know, Israel is being destroyed and we don't have any um, restoration or blessing for Israel. And he, you know, he brought that point up, you know, which I make it with them all the time because they always want to say, well, we're in bondage and everything. And so I always, I said, look, did you really read the text that said some of them were redeemed and some entered the kingdom, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he brought the point up today. He said, well, look, you can't lump all of Israel together. And I said, well, that is true. And uh, he, and so he went on to explain why you couldn't, because there were some, you know, who believed and, um, and so not all of them. So, and I said, look, man, I said, I've been trying to get this point across for a couple of years now to that community. <laughs> and, uh, and and so he acknowledged it. And then I just went in and added some more verses under. But, you know, maybe once the fact that he's acknowledged it, uh, other people who are in that community will see the point that I've tried to make with them uh, over time. And what was interesting, though, he prefaced. <laughs> you have to just get a, a bang out of this. He prefaced our discussion in his comments today. He says, look, he says, all the rest of you guys have dropped the ball with William Bell. He says, I'm going to show you how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty neat. <laughs> oh, yeah. So they'll, I, I love, they'll have yeah, to deal love, with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we, we see that kind of an attitude very, very often when, when people, uh, they may not express it in quite those terms, but you know very good and well that they come on and say, well, nobody else can do what I'm, I'm about to do. I, I'm going to show these predators, uh, you know, what's wrong. And they last about 15 minutes and then they disappear. <laughs> but that sounds like, like a really, really profitable exchange that you've been having there. And, and that's absolutely great. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just another example of how more and more people are coming to see that there are genuine challenges to the to the traditional views uh, that cannot be answered by traditional eschatology. That they just simply have no answers. And preterism is truly the only view that that can answer these challenges. Uh, I know on the Now TV Network, you uh, you did, I don't know if you finished it yet or not, but you did a series on why the study of prophecy is important. Well, I'm doing a series, my introductory series, is the challenge of Christ. You know, Jesus said, and you and I have uh, discussed this with countless numbers of people, uh, when we were going to Abilene Christian University and we had a booth there, we we confronted them with the challenge of Christ. And that challenge of Christ is in John 10, 35 to 37, where Jesus said, do not believe me for my words sake, believe me for my works sake. If I do not do the works which my father has given me, do not believe me. So here is the challenge of Christ. And, and I got to tell you, you know it, I know it, countless other people realize it that the Muslims, the Jews, the atheists, all realized that Jesus predicted his coming for the first century. And they they said he didn't do it. Therefore, he failed. And since he failed, he cannot be the Son of God. He cannot be the Messiah. And amillennialism can't answer that. Postmillennialism can't answer that. Dispensationalism cannot answer that. Only covenant eschatology, only preterism has the answer to that challenge. Jesus issues the challenge. If I do not do what the Father gave me to do, do not believe me. The challenge was, 
Well, what did the Father give him to do? The Father gave him judgment, resurrection, his coming. Has he done it or not? And it seems to me like this, this challenge of Christ is so commonly ignored by a great number of, of Christians who just gloss right over it as if it doesn't even exist. And say, well, we're supposed to believe in spite of the fact that we don't, we can't show where he kept his word. Well, I'll guarantee you what, the Muslims, the Jews, and the atheists are acutely aware of Jesus' challenge. They are acutely aware of Jesus' predictions about his coming. And when Christians find themselves unable to answer the question, did Jesus keep his word? Then the atheists, the Jews, and the Muslims win. And you and I, you and I experienced that realization at Tulsa some years ago when we were privileged to talk with large numbers of college students, young people, going to college, being confronted by atheistic professors, having no answer from their traditional uh, views, having no answers at all. But when we would provide them the answers, show them how to answer that, they were just absolutely ecstatic. And of course, the tragedy was we would actually witness them sharing those thoughts, sharing the answer to Jesus' challenge with their preachers or elders, and being informed, do not go back over and talk to those men. Stay away from those guys. Yeah. I mean, folks, we witnessed this for ourselves. And it's so sad that here is, here is a, 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 a paradigm, the all-in-all paradigm, that has no answer for the challenge of Christ. None. Zero. Zilch. And these young people are going off to college. They're being confronted with the challenge of Jesus. And their, their tradition of the all in the world gives them no answer. And this is one of the reasons, it's certainly not the only reason. I mean, they're being indoctrinated in, in atheistic evolution. They're being indoctrinated in secular humanism. They're being indoctrinated in everything that is anti-Christian. But I'll guarantee you, one of the one of the failures of the traditional paradigm is the failure to deal with the challenge of Christ. They have not, they are not, and they cannot deal with the challenge of Christ when it comes to eschatology. And that is just an incredibly sad reality. And again, what I started to say, it's one of the reasons, not the only one to reiterate, but it's one of the reasons why almost 60% of young people who go off to college leave the church. Now think about that, folks. Almost 60% of young people who go off to college leave church. They abandon Christianity. And preachers, elders refuse to acknowledge, refuse to even try to deal with the fact that part of the reason they are abandoning Christianity is because of what they are confronting at college, and that is the perceived failure of Jesus, the perceived false prophecy of Jesus, the atheistic professors who tell them your Jesus failed, your Jesus was a liar, and their preachers don't, haven't given them answers, their elders haven't given them answers, their parents haven't given them answers, their traditions their church hasn't given them answers, and since they don't have any answers and can't find answers, 
they're left floundering, grasping, and they abandon the faith. And yet, it's so exciting, invigorating, wonderful to hear from these very kind of young people and individuals who have basically lost their faith as a result of, of the teaching of failed eschatology in the church and across all denominations. They have come to realize, they've, come, they've discovered coveted eschatology. And as a result of that, their faith is renewed. Their love of the Lord is renewed. They are finding themselves in love with God and with Christ and his word all over again. And there's just, there's nothing like the thrill of hearing from people like that who contact us. They contact William. They contact me. I'm sure that they contact other teachers of current eschatology as well and express their profound appreciation for sharing the truth of fulfilled eschatology. No failed Messiah, no uninspired word, not, not a Jesus who, who lied or was mistaken or was deluded. No, 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 no. We can stand up and we can confidently say to the world, as I was sharing with a, he's a real estate agent here in town, and he's a Baptist fellow. He had actually been confronted by, by some Muslims. And he told me, he said, Don, I don't have an answer for them. I don't know what to tell them. I said, let me share with you the answer. And he was stunned. He was literally just blown away. And it was like, well, why haven't I known this? I said, well, that's because your church doesn't teach this. And I said, the bottom line is, Tom, Jesus wins because Jesus kept his word. We don't have to apologize for Jesus. We don't, we don't have to say, well, I, I know that's what he predicted, uh, and um, I don't have an explanation for that, but I believe in him anyway. We don't have to say stuff like that. We can stand up and confidently and boldly say to the world, <clears throat> Jesus did not fail. Your refusal or your failure to understand Hebraic thought, Hebraic literature, Hebraic apocalyptic language is lies at the root of your false accusation against Jesus. If you understand apocalyptic language, if you understand covenantal language, you would never, ever accuse Jesus of failing. You would realize and you would know he did not fail. He kept his word. He came in the glory of the Father exactly and precisely like he said he was going to. And so, you know, here, I, I, our mission here on two guys in the Bible here on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust, is to just keep telling people. The challenge of Christ is there. It's an undeniable challenge. The question is, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to answer the challenge of Christ? Are you going to keep repeating the, the same old false narrative of futurism that says, oh, well, you know, Jesus didn't really say he was coming back in the first century. Uh, the apostles didn't really mean that the coming of the Lord was at hand. No, no, no. Not, none of that language means anything. And people who are linguists, people who are uh, good students, people who, who can read the Greek dictionaries know that is a charade of an argument. They know it's a false argument. They know there is no merit to it whatsoever. And they literally turn their back on that kind of nonsensical argumentation, as they well should. They should just simply realize Jesus not only said he was coming back in that generation, he did so. 
in the same way that the Father had come many, many times before. And, well, William, it appears that we are out of time. Uh, didn't get a whole lot covered on, uh, you know, on the Messianic Temple. Uh, I don't know how in the world that happened. <coughs> but anyway, uh, we'll, we'll pick it up next week. In the meantime, folks, thanks so much for joining us here on Two Guys in the Bible on Fulfilled Radio, a voice you can trust. And with that, I will say good night and God bless. Thank you for joining the Two Guys in a Bible radio broadcast. On behalf of Dunn Preston and myself, we'd like to say have a very pleasant day and may God bless. Until next time, we'll see you on Fulfill Radio, a voice you can trust.